That's good. Okay, we're just gonna wait for Chair Joy Knight. Are we are you ready, Council Member Joy Knight, Chair? I am, but I'm seeing I'm not sure why I have the New York City Council Committee of Small Business Joint background that was dominated this um, I'm having trouble hearing him. Is anyone else having trouble hearing? Do you hear me now? Yes. Hear me? Okay, good. Mark, I'm just go, go up on top of the where it says the view. Put put the uh, change the view that you have. Uh, you might have speaker view. No, it changed uh, by itself. Hold on a second. Is Mine did the same thing, Chair Joe and I. You just got to go to speaker view and click it. There's a small little box you click. And we'll go back to right, upper right. I got it. I'm back. Okay, good. Okay, Sergeant, you can begin with your speech when you're ready. Good morning, and welcome to the remote hearing on small business jointly with the Committee on Technology. Will all council members and staff please turn on their videos at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones, electronics to vibrate. Also, you may send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am council member Mark John. I chair of the Committee on Small Business. I'd like to welcome you to our joint hearing today on how technology can boast small businesses during this pandemic. I'd like to start by thanking my colleague and friend, Chair Holden, for chairing this hearing with me today. Small businesses across the city are struggling right now. The COVID-19 crisis has caused thousands of businesses to close permanently. According to an August report by the city comptroller, Small business revenues have dropped by 25% since January. In early April, small businesses were experiencing a drop in revenue of over 60%. As small businesses are grappling with decreased revenue, many small businesses have been unable to pay rent. A recent survey by the Hospitality Alliance found that 87% of respondents did not pay their full August rent as small businesses are experiencing massive declines in revenue. Thousands of small businesses have closed in New York. According to the city controller's report, at least 2,800 small businesses closed permanently between March 1st and July 10th. Partnership in New York City predicts that as many as a third of the 230,000 small businesses in New York City may never reopen. The pandemic has also called small businesses to rapidly change their business models to reflect new consumer preferences and expectations. Mainly, the digitalization of the economy has forced small businesses to develop websites, marketing, and e-commerce models. Those small businesses have been unable to afford these new technology innovations or lack the know-how of developing these systems and are at a competitive disadvantage. Akemea, the internet continent delivery, cloud and cybersecurity firm reported that there was a greater than 50% increase in daily online traffic than the average day prior to COVID-19. An Adobe analytical report on the digital economy found Total online spending in May was up by 77% year over year. <clears throat> According to Adobe Team, we are seeing signs that the online purchasing trend formed during the pandemic may see permanent adoption. A recent report by the Department of Commerce similarly found that more than $1 in every five was spent online in quarter two of 2020 the highest e-commerce penetration of any quarter on year on record. As online sales became a greater aspect of the consumer shopping experience, however, certain mom and pop shops without an online presence 
may face difficulty remaining competitive. This change in consumer shopping preferences may also disproportionately hurt immigrant-owned businesses and family-owned mom-and-pop shops that are less flexible to change. While takeout has historically been a staple for restaurants in Chinatown, for example, participating on third-party delivery platforms is much less common. As an immigrant and minority-owned business tend to be undercapitalized operations with a smaller financial cushion, they may have less of an ability to spend money and time to develop a strong online marketplace. Consumer preferences for digital shopping will not change. So businesses will adapt or die. Without the necessary financial resources to evolve their business, however, the small business community may look to the government for help. I look forward to hearing about the administration's plan to ensure that all small businesses have access to resources necessary to remain competitive and resilient during this period. While I understand and am sympathetic to the stark budget that this city is facing, New York State is able to partner with private e-commerce companies to offer resources to small businesses. I hope the city has the same innovative spirit and will forge strong private public partnerships to give our small businesses a fighting chance. With that said, I'd like to thank my chief of staff, Reggie Johnson, legislative aide, Austin Sacker, our senior legislative counsel, Christopher Satori, our policy analyst, Noah Mexler, and financial analyst, Aliyah Ali, for all their hard work in preparing for this hearing. Before I turn it over to my colleague, I just want to say, we are looking at financial straits and devastation for all of our small businesses. And all we've heard up until now is we're waiting on the federal government or the state to come to our aid. Our small businesses cannot rely on promises that may never come to fruition. We owe it to our small businesses to come up with creative ways to keep them in business. Whether that's done by lowering their expenses, increasing their sales, or providing grants and loans that will keep them afloat, it's going to be the priority of this council to work with this administration to find ways to help these small businesses survive so that they can thrive in the future. With that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Council Member Holden to give an opening statement. Council Member. Thank you and good afternoon. I am Council Member Robert Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology, and I'm pleased to, to join the Committee on Small Business, chaired by my good friend from the Bronx, Council Member Joe and I. And thank you all for attending today's hearing. Uh, today, we'll, we will be focusing on the challenges that small businesses face in New York City during this pandemic and how technology can lever be leveraged to assist these businesses as they adapt to this new reality. Uh, our small biz businesses, uh, like uh, uh, Mark Joe and I said, are suffering during this pandemic. Mom and pop shops are vital to the economy of the city and crucial to the lives of hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers that own, work, and patronize these establishments. With more than 230,000 small businesses, New York City is home to the country's most small businesses and the highest number of minority-owned businesses. So, you know, uh, the coronavirus has forced many small businesses to close down and many of them, unfortunately, for good. Uh, others have been forced to find ways to safely reopen and transition to the digital marketplace to even stay afloat. We are witnessing our economy and society undergo a digital transition. What was previously a more gradual change has been shocked into the immediacy. Online interactions become the norm to, to minimize physical exposure and obviously and potential transmission of the COVID-19. Um, in, in a 2020 report, McKinsey and company found 
that small businesses did not have the financial capital necessary to effectively establish uh, an online presence even before the coronavirus brought about this shock. Additionally, the pandemic's effects mean that small businesses now have to rely on technological assistance to form uh, to continue to operate. Uh, technological assistance for small businesses can come in many forms from conducting sales to combating the coronavirus. For example, restaurants can use food order and deliver, delivery apps to facilitate takeout and use quick response codes, otherwise known as QR codes, to replace physical menus. At the same time, small businesses can convert their website for online transition transactions and incorporate QR codes or other forms of contactless payment. Technology can also be used to combat the coronavirus through innovative solutions like utilizing contactless and in implementing disinfecting methods like UVC lighting, uh, hands-free sanitizer stations, bipolar ionization, electrostatic sprayers, and others. However, small business owners must be protected when seeking to implement tech solutions, especially over cyberspace. The COVID-19 pandemic has already led to an increase in cyber attacks as a whole, as the entire, as entire sectors of the economy were forced to move online. Uh, and the Verizon Business 2020 data breach investigations found, uh, the report found that small businesses made up almost one third of all data breaches in 2020. And that's um, quite shocking. Uh, so even before the pandemic, the Pontiamond Institute found that four, only 14% 14 of small to medium-sized businesses were sufficiently prepared to defend against the cyber attack. Additionally, small businesses must be safeguarded against the potential for online services to collect their data and violate their privacy. As the coronavirus forces small businesses to establish an online presence, it is vital that they be protected against cyber security risk. However, small businesses should not be expected to find these solutions alone. Uh, and uh, not only are they already hurting financially, as we know, uh, from the COVID-19 induced dip in revenue, uh, but incorporating technology requires specialized knowledge that small business owners may not have. Uh, this extends into areas like ensuring small businesses can be resilient against cyber attacks and and understand how to manage an online presence most effectively. As such, the city, and New York City, must find ways to connect these small businesses to the tech assistance necessary to thrive in this new world. Um, we intend to hear the challenges faced by small businesses during this pandemic and how the city can better assist in adapting this to the new reality. Uh, we wish to work together with the administration on this critical issue and look forward to hearing valuable testimony from the administration, small businesses, experts, and advocates. And I would just uh, also like to thank our technology committee staff, Council Irene Bohofsky, uh, the poly analyst Charles Kim, financial analyst Florentine Gabor, uh, and also my chief of staff, Daniel Cusina, and communications director Kevin Ryan for their hard work uh, in preparing for this hearing. Uh, I'd like to recognize um, Council members who are present, uh, Council Member Costantinides, Council Member Perkins, uh, Council Member Lander, uh, Council Member Rosenthal, Council Member Yeager, Council Member Rodriguez, and Council Member Koo. Uh, did I get everybody? We're good? Okay. Uh, I'd like to turn it over back over to my to the chair, uh, Councilman Jonai. Thank you so much. Uh... My dear friend, um, I think you've acknowledged that we missed anyone. I'm sure that uh, someone uh, will pick up on um, the members. Did you call out Council Member Rosenthal? Yes. Uh, with that being said, I'm looking forward to this hearing and the work that we have ahead of us uh, and the, what we get to hear from the public as to what we're going to be needing to do to help these businesses survive. And uh, Chair Holden, I couldn't agree with you more. These businesses have been shut down, not due to their own uh, business models, 
but we forced them out of business and COVID-19 may be the final nail in their coffin. Uh, between consumer behavior changes, e-commerce, big box store competition, uh, and COVID-19, we may be looking at a new small business world and none of the signs or the writing on the wall shows that this is gonna be better than it was before. So I'd like to turn it over to the moderator, Committee Council Christopher Saratori to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Joan I, and just to note, Council Member Vallone has also joined us. I'm Chris Sartori, I'm the Senior Counsel to the Committee on Small Business, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to testify, so please listen for your name to be called, as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. We'll, we will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom hand raise function, and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. Also, please note that all panelists, aside from those from the Department of Small Business Services and the Office of the Chief Technology Officer will be limited to a three minute time limit so that we may more easily accommodate all who have registered to speak. When called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you wish you represent, if any. We will soon call on members of the, rep of the administration to testify. We'll be hearing testimony from Donald uh, Giampietro, Assistant Commissioner of Small Business Incentives and Business Resiliency at the Department of Small Business Services. Edward Ubiera, Assistant Commissioner of Business Programs at the Department of Small Business Services, and Gary Johnson, Director of Strategy and Inclusive Entrepreneurship at the Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Office, Office, Officer, excuse me, will also be present to answer any questions. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representative of the administration. I will call on each of you individually for a response. At this time, I'd ask you to please raise your right hand. Do you firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond to council member questions honestly? Commissioner Giampietro? Yes. Commissioner Ubiero? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Thank you. At this time, uh, I will invite Assistant Commissioner Giampietro to present his testimony. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Chair Chairman. Um, good afternoon, Chair Jonai and Chair Holden, and members of the Committee on Small Business and Technology. My name is Donald Giampietro, Assistant Commissioner at the New York City Department of Small Business Services, SBS. I'm accompanied by, as stated, Gary Johnson, Director of Strategy, and operations at the mayor's office of the chief technology officer. And I am also joined by Edward Ubiera, assistant commissioner of business programs at SBS. I hope that each of you really truly and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy during, during these difficult times and that we're all staying safe. And it is a pleasure and my pleasure to testify before the city council today on how technology as stated by both the chair uh, persons can assist small businesses during this pandemic and with our partners in service at MACTA and other agencies. The New York City Department of Small Business Services helps unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers. As many of you know, by uh, connecting New Yorkers to good jobs, creating stronger businesses and building thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. And we realize that you know, some neighborhoods are, are more in need and have more resources uh, than others. And on the onset of the pandemic, we worked quickly and swiftly as best we could to ensure that our physical um, NYC business solution and workforce one centers continue during this time to offer services remotely, to actually upgrade our own technologies to continue this. 
uh, as the city and as a nation, as we know, we, we quickly learned of the importance of navigating and utilizing technology to you know, basically ensure the continuation of services and, pro and production and programs. It, is, it was necessary, it was vital. SBS, you know, again, worked quickly to ensure to isolate, to see where the gaps were and continue to do so in services and reimagine and redeploy and redevelop our service delivery system to maintain what we did that was, that's effective and to see from feedback from the council and from others where we can make more robust. Uh, we did this expeditiously and effectively to provide access to our small businesses and actually and job seekers because that continues as well, as we all know, if not more. Our centers actually immediately started, you know, it was almost seamless providing services remotely online and over the phone. Funny, you almost reverted back to telephones again uh, to continue many of the services. We quickly expanded our online business course offerings to meet relevant challenges and the changing challenges facing the small business owners you know, and workers and help them take part actually in the e-commerce that had been mentioned earlier. For example, uh, we have our portfolio of programs where we geared more now towards the e-commerce and trying to target those that were less likely to enact this. We have Google An Analytics to improve, maximize website results and programs such as building your own business website and many more. And also these are always very mindful of the financial dynamic that different companies have when doing this and building this out. To date, SBS has hosted 217 webinars, connecting over 48,000 attendees to our virtual services since March. We've gone full throttle. Um, businesses needed guidance and understanding, never in ever-changing regulations, new, new tool kit, new toolkits, uh, evolving dynamics and what and what they could do and what they could not do uh, on the local state level, and we created and continue, and we've had these, but we made the more robust plain language resource guides in multiple languages for each industry. And we tailor it as best we can when the commissioner does walking tours, when some of our dedicated staff, even in this situation, go out to the communities to ensure that it's digestible to the point and in languages and dialects that are understandable. Uh, we wanna make sure this information is easily accessible online, also via the website, and finding the triggers. So when they have terms that are in, of interest to them, it could actually bring them and jettison them to the areas on the site that are necessary. And when we need to from the council or others, we then learn and we'll revise. We offered information not only online, but also understood that businesses need a direct line of contact to help answer and navigate information. My colleague, Edward, was involved in this uh, tremendously and continues. To that end, we launched an SPS hotline, uh, which has now received over 43,000 calls, assisting businesses to navigate new regulations and reopening phases. And we trained and took the, some of the existing staff with their skill sets, modeled a mechanism to provide explicit answers to some of the questions, obtained feedback as to what cluster questions and new concerns there are, and find answers for that, which then could be incorporated in to the hotline responses. And we've connected 4,300 small businesses to over $78 million in local, state, and philanthropic funding. So even in the time of this situation where we know, and we're not going to make excuses, excuses we can't wait for money to come from everywhere, but utilizing the, the resources that exist reprioritizing, maximizing, and making where we can the opportunities robust and connecting where we can effectively, efficiently, mindful of the new needs. Moreover, SBS has worked with our sister agencies, EDC, MOCTO, Cyber Command, the City Council. And actually um, with EDC specifically, we launched a PPE marketplace. We saw the dearth of this and where we had 34% suppliers even using our MWBEs. So that was great, you know, for especially for the agency that, you know, manages the MWBE program, we really utilize this. The marketplace actually gives small businesses, nonprofits and other organizations 
throughout all five boroughs the opportunity to purchase via website medical and non-medical supplies to operate safely and effectively. And this was the, the true need at the beginning. And we know continues to be this, continues as a need throughout the fall. In addition, SBS worked with 80 community partners because we're fortunate enough to have those forged to distribute over 7 million face coverings to small businesses. And that was in such demand at the time, as you recall. SBS has worked hard to be nimble and adaptable. And I'm gonna underscore that because some of the staff has been amazing to in, allow them to respond effectively. And especially the feedback from the council is, has been so uh, dynamic and allowing us, again, to be nimble and to serve where necessary. And again, we still have challenges with the constituents. We are finding the areas where in the vacuums where we need to focus and concentrate. The city rapidly made available self-certification and processes uh, to make it easier for one of the primary uh, industries, restaurants, to be begin servicing customers outdoor right away. We understand that it hasn't, you know, it hasn't been the same in all areas and all neighborhoods. And the inability to eat indoors, which I long for, again, uh, you know, we had to be safe, but we allowed and worked to uh, as diligent as we could to notify and help businesses learn of the requirements for the outdoor open restaurant. The program continues actually to exceed our expectations as many have realized, and there's over 10,600 um, participating restaurants right now, uh, supporting about 100,000 jobs uh, and a diverse group of workers throughout the five boroughs. It's not the final answer, but actually it's, it's been an accent and a help to many. And I, have, I must say in certain areas of this city, it's created a dynamic street environment, reminiscent of Europe and other areas. The result of the open restaurant program actually has again been inspiring in restaurants all over the city. Again, the compliment have created beautiful welcoming outdoor spaces, uh, bringing a sense of hope and vib vibrancy to those who are pedestrian as we are, we're a pedestrian city and the street has at least allowed to see this type of activity in many corridors. Um, here at SBS, we launched a no cost compliance consultation service that my colleague Edward could speak to later to educate and help businesses apply, comply with this outdoor program. Because you can imagine things were fluid, they changed, there was adoption, adaption, and we had the ability to provide in real time counsel on this. Uh, we have been creative and use the latest technology ourselves, such as Zoom, FaceTime, and Instagram. Maybe not as novel for the rest of the world, but for the city, you know, those were used very effectively now, ensuring our business owners and customers' safety. Because in a, in a way, there's two lines to this. There's technology that businesses need to utilize to interact with government, and, and those businesses that don't have that technology for us to realize, to find the means for them to do so. And then the technology to continue and make their operations more robust, going online, evolving beyond the, just a brick and mortar is e-commerce as has been noted uh, by the chair um, persons, the need is growing. Building on the open rep restaurant program, Mayor de Blasio announced this actually this past Wednesday, the open storefronts program, uh, allowing storefront businesses to use a portion of the sidewalk directly in front of their businesses even you know, as the fall progresses, this will be an ability for businesses to bring commerce uh, to, to their location. Um, and by filling out actually a simple attestation, what we've done is we streamline the protocols that typically these types of changes would have, um, would have necessitated. And it's now easier and business owners can commence operating immediately following a very streamlined process. And we know that technology before the pandemic and more so was necessary. We realized and we helped through our business portfolio of online classes, uh, which we have weekly and monthly through our education curriculum, uh, 
the ability to instruct businesses on how to use e-commerce, how to expand their businesses, how to broaden their portfolio beyond the geographies of just their store. And this is even more crucial. And we've been emphasizing this in our um, service set, which again is now accessible online virtually. Um, we know it plays a, cr a critical role in business operations, especially more so, and are proud of the services we are delivering through our online platforms to educate businesses. So in a, in a sense, it was almost, it was seamless to a degree to at least maintain our portfolio of programs. In closing, equity of access and inclusion, we all know it's at the core of the work we do. And we're ever seeking to in, expand our outreach to those areas, to learn uh, from those in the community, those who represent the community uh, and take these learnings and evolve what we're doing and being um, more diligent and uh, creative, again, to innovate. Uh, we're working with our community partners, which has been fantastic. And we've been able to maximize and build off of these relationships we've had for years. Uh, and we're doing this for businesses in New York, uh, for the far reaching neighborhoods, to neighborhoods all over the city that are impacted. And again, for those who are seeking new jobs. I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to testify on this extremely important topic. And we are happy to uh, take your questions. And again, thank you very much. And also, uh, and council people for your uh, recommendations to date. Uh, they've been um, very well received. And, and again, thank you. Thank you, uh, Assistant Commissioner. I would imagine you would agree that if any investment that we could possibly make into small businesses to keep them afloat and in business is a wise investment that will yield a return. Every I small agree. business that stays in business is contributing to our tax base, is creating employment opportunities, and shaping the commercial corridors that our communities rely on. Yes. Prior to COVID-19, we were seeing a large number of vacancies plague our commercial corridors. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 has accelerated that outcome. We heard recent reports that as many as a third of our small businesses may never reopen, which would be a devastation to our city, to the small business uh, engine that drives this city, which will lead to less jobs, less tax revenue. We'll go back to the fundamental questions, Assistant Commissioner. We need to figure out how to raise revenues for sales for these small businesses, which are very difficult. And the only approach that you can offer is e-commerce, helping create a website or a marketplace for them to sell their products and services. How can they possibly compete with the Google search engines, which give priority listings to paid platforms? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even though they make this investment into websites, offering the sale of their products and services, it's drowned out by the search engine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we show them new marketplaces through Amazon, they pay fees that not only eat into their profits, but in most areas lead to a net loss because those percentages are so high to be a part of these platforms. Mm -hmm. If we can't raise revenue, then we have to figure out how to lower their expenses. Yeah, lower and be innovative. And be innovative. Yes, yes, yes. Agree. Currently, we're not lowering their expenses. We're only increasing their expenses because their real estate taxes and water sewer charges mm -hmm. are only increasing year over year. Mm -hmm. What further we've done to our small businesses in this COVID crisis, we've mandated that they make additional investments into PPE for social distancing, face but mask wearing, um, safety in their establishments. We've shut them down. 
So we haven't been able to lower their expenses. We haven't been able to increase their sales. We haven't been able to give them the loans and grants that they need to recreate their business model. Mm, to recreate. Like all of that isn't enough when it comes to small business services or uh, this administration, which is making it much more difficult for those businesses to stay afloat. You referred to learning. The mayor announced the creation of a small business advisory council to issue recommendations to help save the city's small business economy. It's been reported that the advisory council has, hasn't convened in months. According to the Bronx Chamber of Commerce President Lisa Soren, after phase two happened, the meetings stopped. According to the Asian American Federation president, Joe and Yo, mm -hmm. when we were asked to serve on these committees, I said yes, with all the expectations and the hopes that the things that would take would, that would be talking about would be implemented. I think it would be an understatement to say I'm disappointed and actually very frustrated and very, very angry. How do you respond to these small business advocates? Well, I could speak, let me, I'll start with uh, the first part, um, Chairperson Jonai, regarding you know, the innovation. And I can say this, that there has been efforts, some of which actually percolated through many of the industry representatives. So I, I can't speak to the timetable right now of the Small Business Advisory Council. I do know it was meeting, and then in June, some of the ideas uh, percolated and we have been complementing some of the efforts on the empire state development side with their efforts currently where many of our platforms in the business education and webinars and i just don't want to restrict it just to education but to ensure that the businesses that we are contacting realize that broadening their scope and finding ways to increase their market is necessary. Again, I, I, I'll pull away from the rent issues and the real estate issues currently, because we all know, you know, as I always say, as oil is to Texas, real estate is to New York, and it's a renter's situation in New York. And there's issues regarding commercial rents, landlords, mortgage payments. And we can talk about that, of course, if we- right. you, 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 But I, you forget uh, the two that we're in control of, and that is real estate taxes and water real, and sewer, which yeah, real estate the city taxes. is in sure. control of. Exactly, exactly. So you look at the variables of what we control, what we don't control, and, see, and then those things, and those things are some of the items that the industry representatives we have been, we had discussed, you know, of how to, you know, to looking at those separately. Um, I'm not an economist, but I have some familiarity and some, some ideas. Uh, and to state this, what we did very effectively with MAPTA and EDC, because A, there's limited resources, as you know. B, there is innovation and there are many ideas. C, we have this technology uh, center, technology hub at Cornell. EDC has created this platform, almost, um, I would say uh, the term is like a uh, crowdsourcing of ideas. And there's many that can be utilized more quickly. Oftentimes we hear, oh, there's thinking, and then thinking takes months, and then months inevitably results into something a little too late. But here, it's being expedited. There is work being done with EDC and SBS with the Urban Tech Hub. Uh, there are ideas being uh, actually brought together to see how we can use e-commerce. They're actually focusing on uh, actually storefront operations, operating the, effectively on curb use space, which is happening now, um, how to reuse one of the biggest issues, vacant storefronts, a big, a big issue. And then this complements, so we don't have to be redundant to what the Empire State Development is doing in their digitization efforts as well. Um, I can't speak specifically regarding commercial leasing. We do at SBS do have a very strong commercial lease assistance program, which we, as you know, kind of funded again, which provides additional information. Doesn't provide money, 
pro provide something that over the years that I've dealt with businesses, and you probably know how many businesses didn't look at the bottom line, didn't look at their net lease, triple net lease for criteria, didn't realize how this happened, didn't look at their um, 10 year, five year renewal options. And these things we make them privy to. So when they go into their net landlord negotiations, they're a little bit more informed. Now, of course, people need money to pay their rent. I'm not going to speak to that at the moment. However, we are finding ways for those businesses to A, work as we open up the curbs, restaurants utilize their outdoors, businesses that are artisanal, as we say in our Italian artigiani and are very common in the New York City, how they can use the online options that are affordable. And this neighborhood development challenge with EDC and Gary, I don't know if you wanna to speak to it a little bit more, uh, is crucial. And we have to make sure that places that don't have internet have internet. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, if you can't get online, that's an issue and we're tackling that. Gary, do you wanna to speak to that? Sure. Uh, be verbose, thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, uh, council members for, for having me. I send uh, greetings from John Paul Farmer. I think he was meeting with you just a few weeks ago. Uh, and, and just to, to piggyback off of what uh, the commissioner has already mentioned, uh, during the pandemic, the CTO has worked very closely with SBS and our other agency partners, EDC, Cyber Command, the Office of NWBE, to address the emerging needs for small businesses during the pandemic and recovery. Uh, in April, we released our remote work toolkit. This includes best practices for businesses that were able to trans transition online. We reference uh, key services that SBS is already providing, such as their online emergency preparedness workshop uh, that the commissioner mentioned. Um, in addition, uh, we work with Cyber Command who authored a chapter in this toolkit. Uh, uh, the neighborhood challenge, as Don mentioned, this is a an online marketplace that businesses can use to crowdsource ideas uh, in real time uh, and in innovation. This was in a partnership with EDC and SBS uh, to find resources for their challenges that they're seeing. These are businesses that are storefronts uh, in, com in commercial districts that are experiencing severe impacts of COVID-19. Uh, and, and, and the last thing I'll mention, we're working actively with SBS on their NWBE portal. This is how businesses can sign up and receive access to city contracts. Uh, we have a volunteer DevOps team that we'll be working with over the next 10 weeks to make some upgrades to that portal. Uh, this is a small slice uh, of, of the, the number of things that are happening um, that our office is involved in, and we're happy to continue to be work collaboratively with council and with SBS to do more. I want to thank both of you for that very long uh, ah. answer. It wasn't straight to the point. We go to the basics, and I have one more question. We have so many more questions from our colleagues and including my co-chair. It's either we're going to increase sales, we're going to lower expenses, or we're going to give them the grants and loans that they need to reinvent their business models. And you haven't given an answer to any of the three. Mm -hmm. Given the hurdles that they're going to face, mm -hmm. I repeat, if... We're going to lower their expenses. You can't put more government funded mandates of PPE requirements on them and expect them to spend money that they don't have. If you're going to try to increase revenues by creating a marketplace for them and that we start focusing on shop local, stay local, we know of every dollar spent locally, 67 cents stays within that community, that should be the promotion by this administration, SBS, EDC, encouraging everyone to shop locally. And if you don't want to do it in a brick and mortar, and you want to do it on the internet, the e-commerce, shop locally e on uh, the e-commerce platforms. If we can't do either one of those, then we need to give them the grants and loans so they can reinvent their own business models, adapt them to the changes. They mm -hmm. can do it a lot better than we can. They know their businesses. They know what works, what doesn't work. They're the, they have the creative minds that will allow them to build a business model to keep up with the times. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So I encourage you again to focus on one of those three. Lower their costs, increase revenue, or give them the loans and grants so that they can figure it out for themselves. Mm -hmm. With that being said, my question is in the past hearings, SBS Commissioner Janelle Doris, which I'm a big fan of and consider to be a friend, stated that the administration was considering establishing another round of COVID-19 rescue grants and loans programs for struggling local small businesses. Considering that the technology we are discussing today will require businesses to use funding that they do not have, I think now is a good time to get an update from SBS on where the administration is now with another round of desperately needed rescue grants and loans. Assistant Commissioner Donald, do you have an update for this committee and the business onuses that are here today on whether we can expect additional COVID-19 rescue funding for our mom and pop shops without the generic answer of federal government or state aid? Mm -hmm. At this juncture, I cannot, because there are discussions happening, I cannot give a actual explicit yes or no regarding that currently and but and not but to say discounting that in addition what we are doing as we you know ply those through is looking at where all the revenue and access streams we have that can be utilized that exist and ensuring that our business courses and webinars are for are bringing these because we connect businesses to loans and funding through partners uh, all the time, not grants, sometimes. And we're and many of these would be PPE. So in the interim, we would be looking at, and as we're speaking, connecting businesses to those types of resources to help with PPE, even indeed some, some might be provided free. Uh, and also to customize the solutions, because what we're finding is it's not one particular issue fits all. Luckily, the hotline which has been good as we hear the specific issue, it's I, I can afford masks, but I don't have sanitizers. Sometimes it's, I can't find enough. I went to Costco and it's not there, or there's no actual commercial supplier. So what we're doing is we've been pooling these resources and to answer so smartly, the other item, lowering costs, that's what we're trying to do in, in kind of pooled, uh, pooled purchasing. And that's what the neighborhood uh, challenge is doing. So that's what we have been doing. I, I Donald Jam Petro, at this moment cannot speak to uh, you know, the actual discussion for grants and loans. I know we had two programs earlier, which were, we were able to get up. Uh, the second one regarding the uh, response to some of the items did focus more on the Bronx than the, the initial. And um, for those that were happening after some of the, the activities in the street, uh, but we are looking at and actually doing the work to connect businesses to the loans. So I don't want to be roundabout, I just want to be direct. And, and so again, I, um, and we know money, we know companies need resources to purchase the PPE and the technology. Some are more expensive than others. Different industries need different things than others. Mr. Commissioner. I'm going to hit on this last thing with you again. Okay. Real estate taxes and water and sewer is within your control. Mm -hmm. Lowering expenses is within our creative control. Mm -hmm. Increasing sales is within our capabilities. Capabilities, yeah. And unfunded mandates undermine their very existence. We will, I think we could all agree. The smartest investment that we can make in our future and for the sake of our economy is keeping small businesses alive so they can survive. When they're gone, they're not coming back. And nothing that I've heard so far mm -hmm. from you or from SBS is giving me any hopes that we're going to help meet those challenges. Mm -hmm. With that, I'm going to pass it to Chair Holden. Thank you for your patience, Co-Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Jonai, and uh, 
I just want to say we've been joined by Council Member Paul Vallone. Uh, uh, Commissioner uh, GM Pietro, um, I, New, York, New York City Small Business Services is tasked with creating, uh, quote unquote, the economic security for all New Yorkers and strong businesses. Um, according to the SBS website, that you know that, that that you know that's what we read. However, apart from the economic toll our small businesses have been have taken, we're now hearing from our local businesses that they are being harassed multiple times a week by city agencies like the Department of Consumer Affairs, mm -hmm. the Department of Buildings for COVID-19 violations. They're not they're not in compliance with certain rules and regulations. Now. Why, you know, in this atmosphere where these poor businesses were closed for so long and they're, they don't have the customers they once had, why are these agencies not giving small business warning, these small businesses warnings, like go in there and say, oh, you know, you have this problem, you got to fix this, or instead they're giving $1,000 violations uh, because they don't have an official log of for cleaning or uh, they don't have a contactless thermometer, uh, you know, showed quickly, or they are not having uh, you know, one business, a realtor. He doesn't get that many customers. He makes them by appointments. He was fined for not having the six foot distance markers on the floor. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, what is uh, your agency? What is SPS doing to help these businesses who are on the verge of closing down? Mm -hmm. Um you know, get these agents, get these city agencies off our, their backs. Are, are you helping with that? And and yes, and yes, we are. And I understand this is the one arm and the other arm. Uh, and we do have, again, a, a systematic infrastructure to deal with these issues of government navigation. And in July, we actually offered one-on-one -on -one free virtual compliance uh, that works. But actually, my colleague, Edward, Ubiera uh, runs many in some of these business service programs. In addition, uh, our colleagues at the Emergency Response Unit and Navigating Government are actually right now dealing with issues of this, where one agency is coming in uh, to remind, enforce, notify of new, new, new programs or restrictions post-COVID, even pre-COVID, and how we can work uh, to inform prior and do assessments with businesses. Uh, to ensure that they are in compliance or work with the other respective sister agency when something has been found. Edward, if you'd like to uh, continue. Sure, sure. I, I can add. Uh, thank you, Don. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Holden. Since COVID began, um, SBS is, is, is very proud of the, uh, of the rollout of initiatives um, that we've uh, been able to deploy um, to allow small businesses to remain viable and also to operate in this new and explored territory of, of COVID where public health is a key issue. So open restaurants, open storefronts, um, open streets, um, all have presented um, new opportunities for businesses to use curb space and business frontage to be able to generate sales. That has also presented some challenges with, her skip, with respect to new regulations and compliance. And in response to those challenges, we've done a couple of things. Um, first, we've rolled out a, uh, a citywide business hotline where a small business owner can telephonically connect to a hotline agent that is uh, getting accustomed and knowledgeable on both the state's reopening guidelines and also the specific agency guidelines that are being promulgated by the Department of Health, by the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, by DSNY, by Department of Buildings. So that is easy one-touch access telephonically to that kind of technical assistance. Additionally, um, we also have been able to convert our compliance advisory service into a virtual compliance service where a small business owner with um, uh, all they would need would be a smartphone can have an interactive visual uh, walkthrough of their space, of their business frontage to understand where there, be, there could be compliance or regulatory issues. And they could speak with someone who is very knowledgeable on those um, city regulations. Um, we've 
my understanding is we've been able to help over 200 businesses with those compliance consultations. And then there have been a high level of satisfaction with the service delivered there. Additionally, if a business owner um, calls our hotline and they have a specific issue with a permit, a specific violation, a specific utility issue, um, they can connect to a small business advocate or request to be connected to a small business advocate that can do some investigation with the regulatory agency on their behalf. That would be a little bit longer of an intervention. They would have to give more details and information, but the small business advocate could try to work on their behalf. So we truly understand um, the the, the, the pressures of maintaining sales during this environment and also the challenges of being able to uh, uh, con conduct commerce and still be, be healthy. And we're, we're striving to remain ahead of the curve um, um, as the, the COVID public health emergency evolves. Okay, um, but, but can, yeah. I just, like, can I just jump in because I, you know, sure. for the sake of time, um, wouldn't it be easier for you guys to talk to the other to the agencies like consumer affairs uh, or the department of buildings first and say hey guys considering what these these businesses have been through with the covid considering all the money that was lost considering that these guys are are hanging by a thread these small businesses you know give them a break warn them is that is that difficult for the sbs to talk, talk to these agencies and say uh give them a warning first or give them two warnings Give us a break here, guys. Um, mm -hmm. This is not this is not the way the city should be conducting business with our small businesses. This is not the way we should be operating. I didn't hear anybody say uh, that we're talking to uh, consumer affairs and we're saying back off. Can't do that. And just let me interject, Edward. I, and you, I'll go back. Uh, you know we have we had a program we still do the small business first initiative it's doing just that looking at like first time offenses for, for and seeing if there could be relief and we looked at dob uh consumer affairs we go through the various fire especially for restaurants fire and dob which hvac systems and range hoods was an, a, a large issue no, but let me just answer my question please have you spoken to the department of consumer affairs about leave, leave the business. Why don't you, you haven't you haven't spoken to them? Leave these businesses alone, or at least give them a warning. What is wrong with that? Giving them a warning. We're going to come back tomorrow if you guys don't have this, or we're going to if you don't get this in three or four days, we're going to come back and you're going to get a thousand dollar fine. Instead, pop, they give them a thousand dollar fine on the first just first pop in. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous, mm -hmm. and I don't want to hear bureaucratic you know excuses for this. Mm -hmm. That's what you're giving me. Oh, that we'll, we notify the businesses of this and they can do this. And then maybe you know, like two years from now, they'll get a, a judgment again uh, for them or against them. It's not the way SBS, you should advocate and should and talk to these agencies. Uh, and just to no, let you know, there's no true, reason. True, true, true. And that, like I said, we are in constant communication with sister agencies and we have brought up strongly uh, to these agencies uh, regarding first time offenses where it, if they go, uh, one of the things that actually we try to underscore and build is just that. If you go to a business and you see issues, plus we do have these compliance advisors, actually uh, something uh, Chair Joe and I at one time a, a while back spoke of, we're using technology now, as Edward mentioned, to, to view so we don't have to be there, the issue and do an assessment. And uh, again, I can't speak on behalf of other agencies, but we are looking at this and acting on the first time offenses where businesses go uh, and actually businesses have agencies go to them and then provide an, more of an assessment. Right. Yeah. But, you know, like recently I read uh, my colleague, I think uh, Councilman Yeager is on this, uh, this uh, hearing. Uh, he tweeted out a video of a city inspector harassing a small business that was closed to the public. And the DLB inspector was quoted as say, just saying, oh, I'm just following orders. Um, we need a sit down, guys. We need to sit down with these city agencies and the council members. We need to, you know, I need them on this uh, this Zoom too. We need to get everybody on, in a room or somewhere on Zoom and just say, hey, come on. And, you know, I'm going to bring this up to the mayor again, because this, this is not the way we should be treating our small businesses that are, like I said before, hanging by a thread. 
And by throwing more bureaucratic stuff at them, that's not helping matters. Um, so warn them. Again, nobody can answer me why you can't give them a warning. You know why? They have a quota probably. And we're going to look into that because that's another thing. If they have quotas and they're, on, they're doing this on the backs to raise revenue for this city by on the backs of small businesses, that is criminal. That's criminal. And I'm sick of this. And I'm sick of fending off. Uh, I'm getting so many complaints. They just descended on my my community. They descended in uh, all these inspectors, and they just keep banging these small businesses. It's not right. And um, you know, I, I, I'm just beside myself on this. And I'm going to turn it back to the chair. I have a lot more questions, but um, I'm just getting what we're getting here is not the, the, the answers I want to hear or anybody wants to hear. All the small businesses don't want to hear. They they don't want to hear more bureaucratic stuff. They want to hear we're going to stop it and we're going to talk to these agencies and we're going to have a sit down and we're going to uh, and you know i'm going to i'm going to talk to the mayor today because this is this can't go on that's not how you raise revenue right chair john i uh chair holden i agree with you i hear the same and i'm glad that we were able to do this together uh in this hearing where i focus on one component you focus on the other we're not giving them an opportunity to survive. We're doing everything possible to make sure that they fail and shut their doors forever. We don't even mention, uh, you know, it was eloquently uh, discussed, the open restaurants, the sidewalks, the data that has to be taken for indoor dining and the liability in, or in and around that personal data restaurants aren't capable of protecting that data yet there'll be legislation that's going to force someone to walk in where there's going to be a liability and additional fines for lack of information the storage of the information and how we protected it from cybersecurity threats we haven't done anything but hurt our small business and thank you chair holden as one person, uh, just, one, just one thing I just want to bring up before, because I forgot one thing, uh, you know, and maybe you said this, but uh, I'm just like, again, very outraged at, at, at what happened to these small businesses. Does SBS offer any grants for small businesses to uh, procure the necessary technology to not only comply with state and city guidelines, but to also help them increase business during these unprecedented times? Uh, I'm talking about grants now. Um, I, again, I, uh, it, it was raised at this juncture. I'm not privy specifically to grants, but we have every effort. We link them up to uh, loans, various uh, providers of resources, uh, financing and fiscal assistance through our network of providers. Uh, I'm not privy myself right now to additional grants and loans. But, but the grant, see, that's an important thing because <laughs> we're just saying like, like uh, the chair, Joe and I mentioned before, uh, about this, how do you know? We got to help them. They, they, they it's got to come out of their pocket. I had one business had to go spend a hundred thousand dollars to to come up with uh, to comply with some of the. the, the very, very the, we, I'm sorry. We hear this. Yes, we hear this all the time. And, and you, mm -hmm. and you know though, as, as, Assistant Commissioner, that this this business that I'm talking about that spent a hundred thousand dollars, they're not allowed to open yet. Hmm. Uh, these amusement uh, businesses for children, these uh, party places, I have a lot of them throughout my district, and they can't even open. Yeah. And there's no word from the governor, uh, from, from his uh, perch here on the mountain, there's no word when they can open. You imagine that? Mm -hmm. Imagine where there's no word of when these businesses can open. Not, mm -hmm. even, not even one letter, not even one uh, communication. And it's and funny. This is uh, what we're doing. To, and to chair, this. Yeah, and Chair Joan, I had mentioned the McKinsey study that like kind of gradually sees different timelines. I, I mentioned that, yeah. But you, I, I apologize, I apologize. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, we hear this information, the hotline has been ideal. Uh, we do the walkthroughs, the commissioner does. And uh, like I said, sometimes they, even these particular hearings are wonderful exercises because we it reinforces what we're hearing. But I, we're I, hearing think, I think when these businesses, the, the commissioner's gotta go out SBS commissioners got to go out and talk to these businesses that have been beaten up. And, and again, you guys, are, uh, the city, I'm talking about the city, not you, SBS, the city's putting the final nail in the coffin here. Uh, it really is. And that's, again, that to me is criminal because you're destroying entire communities. The COVID 
you know, did did a lot of it and most of it. The regulations did did uh, uh, again a good deal of it. But now to to find them, to find them continually, thousands of dollars. Come on. Yeah. Chair All right. Thank Holden. you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Chair. Chair, let's just follow up on one other fact. It's up to seventy percent of our retail stores rely on the holiday shopping. Hmm. With the fear of a second wave of COVID, that won't happen. In addition, um, the marketing, we know that in online e-commerce, shopping has increased dramatically. What are you going to do to educate mm -hmm. New Yorkers to shop locally? Stay away from e-commerce, and if you're going to do internet shopping, how are you going to point them to a local commercial corridor? Mm -hmm. You go back to some of the very basics. Yeah, yeah. You don't have the money. You're not going to lower their real estate charges, uh, your taxes. You're not going to lower water and sewer. You're not going to stop fining. So what can you do? And what we can be doing, what we are doing, especially is the holiday. And I've been, you know, I've been, it, it, there are discussions. We Luckily, we do have that tentacle and web of locally based groups, our bids, we are engaged. We have an entire division, neighborhood development. Uh, a representative is not here, but we could speak and they are pushing. Plus our online comms team is pushing towards local purchasing. Donald, bids uh, just, just, have uh, their own models. Chair That's John, I, one second. I just gotta, and I, I don't wanna, I'm sorry, I'm turning it back to, uh, you know another question but the department of, i just want to ask the uh, assistant commissioner um i just discovered the department of consumer affairs has a program called the visiting inspector program yes. VIP, mm -hmm. right yeah uh, where they send inspectors to do compliance checks for small yep. businesses in an mm -hmm. effort to find issues that businesses can address to avoid fines so why isn't consumer affairs uh, using this program now for covid compliance i mean you would think you know that that would be the way to go you have a program use it you know will will you guys inform um them to really hey get this program going now more than ever and we have and we i'm going to bring this to edward because under his um auspices we we do something very similar with the resources we have and edward if you could speak yes and thank you so much chairperson well well i i i i want to thank you don and, and thank you chair um as our hotline agents are engaging small businesses and as our uh, virtual compliance advisors are engaging small businesses and our small business advocates are speaking with small businesses, you know, that does give us additional information and input that, uh, that we do share out with our sister agencies on a continuous basis. And that is ongoing. And uh, we appreciate the comments of this hearing to understand some of the, 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 the ongoing pain points. Um, uh, in terms of the holiday season and boosting sales, um, as Don indicated, um, the open storefront program, which was launched recently, SBS and its community partners, the bids, the CBOs, and our sister agencies and our private partners, we will be uh, very aggressive in communicating um, uh, and highlighting uh, to, to shop small uh, and, and shop local uh, over the next uh, several weeks. And uh, you will you will likely see um, uh, a fair amount of, of, of marketing communications across multiple channels to highlight that and give businesses um, that opportunity. And um, uh, yeah, we we are we are going to be as diligent as possible in making sure that open storefronts um, uh, gives that revenue generating opportunity uh, to the small business community. Assistant Commissioner, thank you. But all day long and every day, we're talking about an uptick in COVID cases. Open storefronts is going to be counterproductive because as soon as we get off this hearing, someone from this administration will be talking about an uptick in the importance of people staying home and away from crowded places. If you can't leave your house to shop locally, brick and mortar establishments, open storefronts, mm -hmm. it'll be a failed program. It's just another smoke and mirrors approach. In the upcoming days, we're going to be telling New Yorkers we're coming to two percent. You'll be looking at additional closures. You're not. You should not be outside unless absolutely necessary. 
We go back to the fundamentals. If I tell them to shut her in place, stop the spread, what good are open storefronts? Well, uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, hopefully, um, uh, the mitigation strategies that um, um, uh, Department of Health and Health and Hospitals Corporation are, are, are operating um, will, will, will allow us to avoid um, uh, th th that eventuality. But um, um, we are hopeful that open storefronts will provide a window of, of, of revenue generation during the duration. And I also want to add that in addition to a lot of these place-based strategies that we've employed since COVID began, um, we have uh, additionally introduced e-commerce as a business education yeah. uh, product uh, in our business solution centers or through our business solution centers. So small business owners um, are now getting additional information, a little bit more fine-tuned information on how to um, have an online and digital presence and generate sales digitally. And so um, we recognize that, and we are we are continuing to build that 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 service offering. And um, uh, we we further hope that the partnership with EDC, the Neighborhood Tech Challenge, will help us bring to scale some additional innovative pilots that will be targeted towards storefronts and the e-commerce economy. And we look forward towards being able to talk about that in the months ahead. Chair, I think we should uh, leave it to the moderator to start asking the other council members that have been so patiently waiting. Uh, they have questions of their own, and we should follow up afterwards. Is that okay with you, Chair? That's good. That's fine. Thank you. Let's pass it to the moderator. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will now turn to other council members to ask their questions in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom rent, uh, raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. <coughs> begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin delivering your testimony. At this time, we will first hear from Council Member Ku, who has a question. Time starts. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Commissioners, and thank you for the two chairs for holding this meeting. Uh, my, my initial question is, the city has two rules, two sets of rules, right? And they only apply the rules to the licensed business, small business owners, like the two chairs already mentioned, uh, during these difficult times, all these agencies go to different stores and give them a uh, fines, um, which can easily be avoided by giving them verbal warnings. But at the same time, now they want to do open uh, storefronts. But we, the Ministry forgot we have already a lot of uh, vendors on the streets. If you come to like Main Street Flushing, the whole Main Street this is called is full of unlicensed vendors on one side of the, the sidewalk. They sell everything under the sun, you know, pots and pans, crabs, you no, know, I'm talking about real live crabs, you know, on the streets. And uh, groceries, uh, fake clothes, uh, fake uh, handbags, and tons of people selling PPEs on the sidewalks. And the alcohols, the sanitizers. We have tons of people lining up on the street selling all those masks you now. So meanwhile, how do you expand regular business? When regular business owners do their business, there's no business. When you buy stuff from the stores, they charge a sales tax, right? And city makes the money. But when customers buy something on the street, city doesn't get anything. So, but meanwhile, there's no enforcement. I have been talking about this for months already. I mentioned personally to the mayor, he said, oh, we're gonna take care of this. And right now, NYPD is too busy. But NYPD is not that busy anymore. They, not every day they go to protest movements, especially the local precincts. They have the personnel, but they just need some directions from the administration saying, hey, you guys can do enforcement. 
I don't know how hard this is. Just the mayor opened his mouth and said, feel for us, do the job. We, we, we're not going to change you. Uh, meanwhile, you send the minister and you send city agencies, give them fines to regular um, uh, uh, store owners. But they know the people selling things on the street. Nobody asking anything. You can sell anything on the streets. Nobody stopped you. You can sell cigarettes. You can sell all kinds of illegal things now. There's no enforcement. That's the, the bad thing. So why should store owners pay property tax, pay sales tax, pay all these tax to support the city? The city doesn't deliver any service to the, to the small business owners. Meanwhile, in addition to those, you see people peeing on the streets, homeless people, crazy people. Uh, they just lie in front of the banks. Why in front of the banks? They just lie there. Don't do anything. They're drunk or they, they, they pass out. And they, they scare off the customers. So I'm saying all this because SBS is supposed to help business owners, right? Meanwhile, from what I heard, it's all talk, right? No actions. If you can tell the mayor to come do some enforcement, get rid of the illegal vendors on the streets, it will help business owners a lot because they will cut down their competitions. The main competitors is on the street. People selling things much cheaper than store owners. And so how do you respond to that, uh, Assistant Commissioner? Well, I could just, um, I have not full familiar, I have some familiarity back down when the East Village had illegal street vending and some on Fifth Avenue about like 20 years ago or so. I think it's all over the city. Now, yes. No, but, it's so all over I, the city. I, very, I understand, understand. Um, I'm, 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 I've been taking notes as you've been speaking to bring that back. I can't speak to illegal vending. There is a for, an, an enforcement issue, yes. But I am noting that and uh, we will get back and take action on this. Meanwhile, like, we're talking about technology, right? You see mm -hmm. people buying from, the, from Amazon, from all these online providers. The only way we can stop that is to- Time's expired. Charge it, make them charge a delivery charge and sales tax. That will discourage people from buying online because it's so convenient if they sell free delivery, right? So if they make them charge a delivery charge and charge, make sure they uh, apply the sales tax, uh, and you will like, force people uh, to rethink, uh, maybe I should buy locally because the, uh, the delivery charge is so high, you know? Mm -hmm. I took note. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Koo. We'll now hear from Council Member Vallone. Time starts now. Thank you to both of our co-chairs for your passionate support and rallying cry for a small business. Um, I think we can just be easy for my part today because one of the co-chairs, Council Member Mark Joan and I with Small Business and I are setting up a hearing for December jointly with my committee with EDC and Small Business on some of the portals and platforms that you mentioned today. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the information that Chair Councilmember Holden asked for and did not get, we can then bring to that hearing. So, so for Councilmember Holden's points that we are not getting to today, and same thing with Councilmember Joni, we can expect those same questions in December so we can be prepared for those answers because through economic development, I know uh, Assistant Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner, you mentioned some of those portals and access and programs and loans, especially with the new e-portals and online services. So I don't know if you want to mention or just give a brief description of that now, or if you want to wait for December, but the partnership with EDC and the new approach for online support is mm -hmm. critical, just as Council Member Jonai said, that at any minute the mayor could decide to, you know, once again, scare everyone to staying home. 
and not going back to our small businesses. So that may happen. Um, these online portals and the access are, are even more critical now. Um, I think we have a rally today with Congressman Meng and her congressional bill for outdoor support and for dining. So there is a federal, state, and local push mm -hmm. to trying to save our restaurants. So if, if you wanted to give a little summary now of that partnership with EDC and some of those online um, support systems that are in place, that would be fine. If you want to wait for December, I'll leave that up to you. But I was going to an overview and maybe, uh, it, it, again, I uh, in, we could elaborate more in December. But again, it's also platforms that with uh, EDC and perhaps Gary could could jump in as well. Uh, that we know that again, as uh, a chairperson uh, Joe and I mentioned, there's like certain variables that we control and not control, and and not everyone has equal access to certain technologies. But there are innovative ideas that are actually developing. So there's going to be basically a platform with EDC in this this neighborhood. Uh, the neighborhood challenge it's this tech forward initiative where there's uh this you know crowdsourcing of various solutions that would would be activated and that perhaps there'd be means to um provide targeted areas or targeted portions of the city businesses of, of in different communities that might be more in need or not and that's happening b uh, there are platforms such as the nyc.gov business portal where fines, fees, it's almost like a turbo tax, if you will, where we can go through and determine what is necessary. And then again, utilizing online tool and video technology to assess uh, location and then to build e-commerce. And again, underscoring what we were saying here to the local level. So it's not like I'm buying from Missouri, I'm buying from uh, you know, Mazbat. But Gary, if you could go, I'm well, sorry. Well, let me just interject there for a moment because we really don't have to reinvent the wheel on that. My suggestion yeah. would be is that between the chambers of commerce and the local bids that we have in place, we know exactly what the businesses are suffering for, where they are located, what mm -hmm. each main street, and each councilmatic exactly. district. Exactly. So we don't have to go searching for a business that doesn't have an internet capability. We already know the areas that are in trouble and the areas that may have that anyway and are still in trouble. So what I would like to do is to immediately access those chambers of commerce and those businesses that we're already aware of mm -hmm. into that loop already. And then you'll have a, a headstrong yeah. start. It's like a jump start. Yeah. That would be and my, my suggestion would be. And then to have that through each borough, we could easily then ramp up. And then for those that are missing, we would they would be looped up into that process because start with the 99% that we know of and let's get that 1%. Yeah. And that's why it's going to be this like crowdsourcing platform. Gary, do you want to speak to, um, and again, in your December hearing, there would be more. Uh, Gary, thank you. Yeah, I, I would agree. Perhaps the, the December hearing where you have EDC involved would can provide more detail. Uh, our office is happy to be involved with such an initiative with, as a neighborhood tech challenge. Uh, our role is to promote it throughout the larger tech community. But I think right. the commissioner outlined it well. It's creating a, 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 a crowdsourcing solutions to problems that we know and new problems that our storefront businesses are facing uh, and, and seeing how innovation and tech could help solve for those problems. Well, I think as both chairs said, and I know my time's up, they, we know what those problems are now. It's just a matter of looping them in, getting them that service and getting them that grant ability. And that's where our partnership with EDC and with you and the council members, uh, we do have time and our time left together to do this and we can get it done quickly. And we can just tap into our chambers and our local bids and we'll have what the issue is right away. Thank you to both of our chairs. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd ask any other council members who have questions to please use the Zoom hand raise function if you have any other questions for the administration. Seeing none, at this time, we will move on to testimony from members of the public. Uh, no, not, uh, not yet, please. I have some other questions. I, oh. I didn't ask a question of the CTO. I'd like to... Uh, oh, Council Member Holden, please go uh, ahead. Not going to get off that easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, uh, 
in February, we had a hearing on cybersecurity for small businesses. Uh, at the hearing, you informed the public about the Moonshot Challenge you organized on, uh, I think it was August uh, 5th of 2019. Uh, my staff was honored to attend the award ceremony a year ago. The award was a nominal amount uh, of $10,000 for the first three nominees. Uh, have they received the, the money, the monetary award? Mr. Johnson, could you, could it be, are we on mute? I think he's uh, on mute. Okay. Uh, he's muted again, so you gotta unmute it. On you, please, yeah, thank you, okay. All right, can you hear me now? Thank you for the question, Council Member. Uh, I recall the, the hearing in February. Uh, the, all of the awardees, all of the uh, China, uh, challenge finalists, excuse me, have been awarded the, those grants. So they received the money? Correct. Okay. Um, and when did they get it? Do you know when they got it? Um, I have to uh, sort of confer with the team specifically, but I think it, 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 it took a, a few months after the challenge closing just on some pre procurement mechanisms that were delayed. Okay, and, and in January of this year, your office issued an internet master plan. Um, we had a hearing on broadband issues only about two weeks ago and discuss initiatives related to the digital divide, including projects in NYCHA. Uh, do you plan to address uh, these issues uh, related to broadband access for small businesses? You know, can we apply that to small businesses? I appreciate the question. Uh, I think that the short answer is yes. Uh, these upgrades are gonna target uh, communities that first and foremost have been hard hit, hardest hit by COVID-19. Uh, a lot of these are, communities are co-located with uh, NYCHA properties. Uh, so the upgrades will benefit residents in addition to the businesses that are in those corridors. Uh, the internet master plan is, is supposed to create access for the entire city, but again, prioritizing neighborhoods that are underconnected currently um, and the proximate businesses that are in those corridors. Okay, uh, on uh, February 25th, we had a hearing that we asked this question. Um, um, and we'd like, you know, we'd like a follow up. In May 2019, your office issued a report called Truth in Broadband, uh, Public Wi-Fi in New York City. According to this report, the CTO's office would collect relevant agreements, like GIF agreements between the city and Wi-Fi providers for free public Wi-Fi systems and post them on the website. It's on page 22 of the report. Are these agreements collected and posted? Uh, uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Um, I, I would have to confer with my broadband team on that uh, question specifically. I, I, I will say that since that plan was issued, uh, we've made advances on our broadband agenda. As you are aware, uh, we've uh, now secured some, some funding to advance the uh, creation of this network. Um, uh, as you're aware, we're hoping to have the, an RFP out very soon and to begin uh, services uh, starting in the top of the year. Okay, because um, uh, according to the report, your office will, will develop a uniform contract language based on recommended policies and standards to be used as a template for future Wi-Fi development. I mean, was that done? Can we, you know, and can, can so, we get a copy of the template? So I'll, again, I'll confer with the team on that specific point. Um, my understanding that our, our focus has shifted to the IMP, which is the most recent document. It's a, actually revision of that strategy. Uh, as my understanding, we're working with 17 agencies currently to map the city's various assets. Uh, so I think that is going to be the, the, the current approach uh, to the deployment of broadband, but I, I'll get you an answer on that. Uh, I'll confer with the team. Yeah, and because during, during the briefing with our committee on public Wi-Fi in the summer of 2019, your colleague Joshua mentioned that your office will be working with the Office of Cyber Command to issue cybersecurity protocols applicable for public Wi-Fi. It is, you know, we want to know, we want to hear the, you know, the progress in drafting these protocols, and and when, you know, when can we expect them? So, if that, if you can get back to us on that too. Yes, yes, we'll do. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair John I. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think we uh, 
assistant commissioner. Obviously, the next hearing is going to be important as you follow up with some of the questions. Uh, but I must say that I'm disappointed that we really haven't heard anything uh, from SBS uh, that will address those points that um, our small businesses are holding on to dear life, which are helping get through this. I encourage you to start thinking of creative ways to increase sales, decrease expenses, uh, help them find the loans, the grants, because loans have to be paid back, and help them get the grants that they deserve to stay afloat. Otherwise, we're going to be looking at a whole new city uh, after COVID. I think you are, you're on mute, Steve. Thank, thank you, Chair Jonah. At this point, we will move on to testimony from the public. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. So please begin once a sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you after each panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. So please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would like, I would like now to welcome Clayton Banks of Silicon Harlem to testify, followed by Jessica Walker of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. Um, please begin, thank you. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Clayton Banks, and I am the co-founder of Silicon Harlem. Clayton, uh, can, Mr. Banks, can you get a little closer to the microphone? We can't hear you very well. Okay. How about this? Better. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so again, I'm Clayton Banks, co-founder of Silicon Harlem. And if you don't mind, allow me to just... Uh, give you a, a quick uh, idea about what we're thinking as it relates to uh, small business and technology. Um, and in fact, recently I uh, had an op-ed published on tech investments to avoid the next divide. We all know the uh, crisis that has happened around technology given the pandemic. Um, I believe that if we make thoughtful and broad-based investments in the um, infrastructure, we can ameliorate, if not, you know, completely um, avoid the next digital divide. So my testimony has essentially been framed around three key eliminations as it pertains to how technology can assist small businesses during the pandemic and post pandemic. One of the things as I've listened to the call, we've talked a lot about the present, but there's a whole future that we'll have to contemplate on both the broadband side as well as the small business side and technology. Um, and during the early days of the pandemic, as I had my um, general counsel die on March 12th, so I was in a, and my company was on a rapid response. And um, as a small business, it's very dramatic to have anyone leave, uh, certainly from that perspective. Um, but we did a rapid response of, of knowing that uh, public housing was going to be very vulnerable and a lot of the low income and senior citizens, et cetera. So we were able to get out some computers and some th smart thermometers and did a lot to uh, even wire up some local uh, public housing uh, shared spaces. Um, and that's one of the issues is broadband in and of itself. The second one is, of course, the lack of devices. So as I mentioned, we were able to provide several families computers to help them um, with the fact that schools were closing down and in some cases helped their parents who had lost their jobs. And third is that adding on to those two issues is that the small businesses um, were having a struggle here, as you know, everything from Coogan's on down. Um, and a lot of it had to do with digital literacy. They were not prepared. So I wanna stay within my time. I hope that that illuminating of the problem is, is clear. I wanted to offer some solutions and some, uh, some actual recommendations 
that we can all perhaps embrace because I was talking to the actual uh, inventor of the internet. No, it wasn't Al Gore. It was actually Vint Cerf. And he said to me, we should not let a crisis go to waste. So given New York and New York City and the great minds here, it became clear to me that we must also focus our attention on how- Time's expired. Oh, can I just give one or two quick uh, um, advisements? Yes, please. All right, tech enabled workforce development. I think there's an opportunity here to do working spaces where our owners can get uh, digital skills. Uh, broadband, we've already talked about, and we are an ISP as well. Uh, Tech-enabled government services, data-driven customized reopening plans, and telehealth workers benefit. I will submit my entire uh, testimony so you can read the details of each of those. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Banks. We'll now hear from Jessica Walker of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce, and she'll be followed by Ryan Naples of Tech NYC. Hi, and thank you. Thank you. I'm Jessica Walker, the President and CEO of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. We represent the business community across the borough. Uh, thanks for holding this hearing. Uh, really, thank you for uh, all you're talking about on the finding issue. I know that's not the focus today, but we have heard horror stories, so happy to follow up on some of that. Uh, but I, I think I just want to say, listen, tech is not just a tool to help. It has to be one of the major solutions here. Mm. New York City has been in the fourth and final phase of reopening since July 20th, and commerce has gradually resumed. But for all intents and purposes, the city remains in an extended pause. Full economic recovery is unlikely so long as consumers avoid activities they perceive as putting them at risk of exposure to the COVID virus. That's been said, uh, but it's absolutely true. Uh, a national survey found that most Americans, 64%, are not currently engaging in normal out-of-home activities, and approximately one in five Americans uh, will not do so until there is a vaccine or treatment for COVID-19. So that is what is de depressing small business revenues and driving demand for online shopping. Um, and unfortunately, it's not going to change anytime soon. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I've been trying to drive home recently is that a lot of people believe that once we have a vaccine that life is just going to you know, uh, return to normal. Uh, and it, I think it's tempting to think about sort of an on off switch that it's gonna bring, back, uh, bring life back to, uh, to the way we know it. But what, everything we know, um, health experts are telling us that we may have a, a vaccine soon, but it's not gonna be widely available before summer, or maybe early fall. Uh, there's going to be some hesitancy to take it, and uh, and so we might be going into 2022 still wearing face masks in public. Um, so all of that is to say, if small businesses are not able to adapt and compete in this new online marketplace, they are unlikely to survive another year um, and, and be able to make it to the other side of this crisis. Uh, quickly, I just want to tell you there is a lot happening. Uh, we have been working with a small business resource network, which all five chambers are involved in. We have embedded a tech support specialist to help on the ground, uh, and so we're ramping that up. There are numerous uh, large tech companies that have made free training available. Uh, we launched a small business tech academy, which really has the immediate goal of trying to help retailers get uh, an e-commerce website quickly so they can take advantage of holiday shopping. Uh, and we're testing out a model for Small Business Saturday that's created an online platform to draw consumers in to support small businesses. Happy to chat more about that. Uh, just quickly, I think what we need is some help uh, from, from elected officials to publicize our Small Business Resource Network, which is available to any small business throughout the city for free, uh, all five boroughs. Uh, there is need for funding as well to help sm uh, some small businesses adopt tech solutions because there is a cost for some. Uh, and of course, we continue to need, uh, quickly, we just continue to need significant federal funding to uh, help the city small businesses and restaurants, and of course, to encourage New Yorkers to shop local. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear testimony from Ryan Naples of Tech NYC, and he'll be followed by Michael Brady of the Third Avenue bid. Thank you. So good afternoon. Oh, it's now. Thank you. My name is Ryan Naples, and I'm Deputy Director of Tech NYC, a nonprofit coalition of more than 800 technology companies in New York. Our city's tech industry currently employs 
330,000 people. And since the pandemic began, our ecosystem has assisted small businesses in innovative ways. Technology firms and the people who work at them inherently understand that the success of New York City small businesses is directly linked to the success of the city itself. My testimony includes examples of technology companies helping small businesses and is a representative summary of our industry's efforts, not a comprehensive list. Tech NYC itself helped develop the state's COVID Alert New York exposure notification app, which alerts users in close proximity to someone who reports testing positive for COVID-19 and then offers instructions for what to do next to stop the spread. Downloaded more than 800,000 times, this app is needed for contact tracing, which is key to getting New Yorkers back to supporting local businesses in person. Tech companies are creating additional tools so that everyone can again feel both safe and comfortable working, shopping, and dining indoors. Recently, the company Clear developed a mobile app called Health Pass that connects a person's digital identity to a COVID-related symptom survey, on-site temperature check, and future vaccination record. Clear is donating free app enrollments to New York City small businesses and restaurants. Of course, the restaurant industry has been one of the hardest hit by the pandemic. And since the crisis began, online delivery network companies have provided millions of dollars in direct restaurant support. Google has also provided grants to hard hit businesses, in addition to creating a pilot program that will help build e-commerce websites for 150 small businesses in New York City. Also since March, online retailers On Deck and Cross River and JustWorks, a provider of online HR tools, have helped small businesses obtain over $1 billion in paycheck protection program loans. Squarespace, an all-in-one platform for developing websites, is supporting its small business customers by offering one-to-one -one financial support and making premium features available at no costs. Accenture provides financial support and built the digital platform for Sky's the Limit, a nonprofit that connects business owners from underrepresented communities with no cost mentorship, training, specialized advice, and startup grant funding. Finally, in New York, individual live performers are themselves small businesses. Through Airbnb's new online experiences that feature the cast of Broadway musicals, this home sharing uh, platform is helping hundreds of artists earn income while live entertainment remains closed. There are of course more examples of how tech has helped small businesses and I would be happy to follow up with everyone to provide additional examples. Also, please feel free to refer any small businesses to Tech NYC that are looking for technological assistance. Time to expire. Thank you. I was just say thank you for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Michael Brady of the Third Avenue Bid, and he'll be followed by Noel Hidalgo of Beta NYC. Mr. Brady, please begin when the sergeant gives the cue. Thank you. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Jonai, Chair Holden, and the members of the New York City uh, Council Committee on Small Business and the Committee on Technology. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on the impact of and need for technology for our city's small businesses. I'm Michael Brady, Chief Executive Officer of the Third Avenue Business Improvement District and Bruckner Boulevard Commercial Corridor, both located in the South Bronx. Collectively, these organizations represent roughly 1,000 South Bronx, largely immigrant-owned mom and pop businesses. The work of these organizations address barriers for district small and micro business owners and build robust equitable economic development tools by demanding equitable city resources, safer and cleaner streets, and responsible mission-driven development. I'm from the Bronx, where the unemployment rate hovers at 30%. I'm also from the Bronx, the same borough that was disenfranchised by New York City's COVID-19 assistance programs. I am also from the Bronx, where we live in a technology desert, one without necessary investment in even basic tech infrastructure. New York's small business community is precariously close to becoming extinct. Sadly, New York City and state did not mobilize early enough, nor have sufficient resources been deployed to assist small businesses. With the onset of the second wave of COVID-19, which will either shutter or severely limit in-person businesses, our small businesses and neighborhoods need extraordinarily, extraordinary technological investments. Shockingly, many of these investments do not require tremendous financial resources. We propose that New York City adopt the following strategy and plan for tech integration into small businesses. Yes, that's right, I said a plan, something that New York City currently does not have. I'll go through high-level points. The detail is in my testimony. Um, number one, internet for all. 
As we've learned during COVID-19, the first COVID-19 shutdown, many businesses, homes, shelters, and communities lack access to stable and reliable internet. New York City could easily create a system whereby everyone would have access to free or low cost internet. A recent quote from the agency Block Power puts a $9 million price tag to bring free internet access to the entire borough of the Bronx. This internet access would not only stabilize community, but it would also assist small businesses, vendors, and entrepreneurs in expanding their reach and quickly processing payments. The Point CDC, in partnership with organizations like DreamYard and Perscolis, have been doing outstanding work in this area and should be leveraged for their expertise. Number two, launch a citywide e-commerce program. New York City should issue an RFP to an e-commerce developer to create a process and program to offer e-commerce build-outs, trainings, fulfillment and distribution planning, and workforce tools to any New York City small business with fewer than 20 employees. While I know we're in a financial crisis and all solutions are, need to be budget neutral, I can't help but think that offering this lifeline would stabilize our city and in the long term, in, in the long term and also leverage the playing field with e-commerce giants. Number three, New York City should move to cap fees and percentages charged by distribution sites or marketplaces like Amazon Marketplace. Time's expired. May I continue? Yes. Y yes, Michael. Number four, uh, provide, digit, uh, pro 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 provide professionalized digital marketing services for any small business that wants one. Websites, social media, point of sale system integration, the concept of an app and QR codes. All of these are required to compete in the COVID-19 world. Sadly, we have not invested in small businesses appropriately in the past, nor have we deployed the appropriate resources to ensure our city's small businesses remain competitive locally and globally. Five, invest in CDFIs and financial technology for long-term access to capital. Number six, invest in citywide thermal mapping to monitor shifts in consumer trends, behavior, and pedestrian foot traffic to better assure that should another pandemic come, up, come about, we understand how consumer behavior change, changes and can brace our small businesses for that reality. Number seven, ensure that small businesses are equipped to address the changing and challenging, challenging regulatory environment of tech integration. Small businesses currently deal with over 4,000 regulations gover governing our brick and mortar businesses in New York City. Uh, the, the, by integrating technology, this, this dramatically increases those regulations as, as the integration can span regulations in multiple states, territories, and countries. Number eight, remove the hurdles of working through New York City agencies like Do It and major utilities and providers while also building out appropriate programs in the area of cybersecurity. James Patchett and the New York City EDC have done a great deal of work in the area of cybersecurity. We must leverage that work and leverage it now. The aforementioned plan is not exhausted and there are certainly much smarter people in the room who can flesh out specifics. However, these points represent a plan, a plan, something that New York City has not come up with. This is something that is currently lacking from the administration and must be addressed before even more, more small businesses, the proverbial backbone of New York City, shudder forever. The public health impact has been great and the subsequent economic impact will have a lasting effect on our city for at least a decade. It is my hope that this body not only understands the severity of COVID-19's impact, but will take, take meaningful and purposeful steps to implement a comprehensive plan to address it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you, Michael, for that uh, incredible outline of a plan. We're grateful to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hear from Noel Hidalgo of Beta NYC, followed by Kusang Sherpa Thaktak. Um, Noel Hidalgo, please begin when the sergeant gives the cue. Thank you. Time starts now. Happy Halloween, everybody. Uh, Beta NYC envisions an informed and empowered public that can leverage civic technology, uh, data, and design to hold government accountable, improve their economic opportunity. Uh, we have over 5,000 civic hackers who are ready to use your talents. Um, we really focus on the people inside of the city's technology community. I want to start off by just saying that the current neighborhood challenge, the Tech Forward uh, platform, is really a distraction of time, energy, and resources. We know what small businesses need, and this administration refuses to address their number one space, their number one need, which is space. Um, We've seen Beta NYC has been a member of the North Brooklyn Open Streets Community Coalition, uh, and we've seen exactly how Open Streets have helped support small businesses. 
we know that the mayor's open storefronts announcement is woefully inadequate. First of all, it prioritizes businesses in Manhattan and some parts of Brooklyn and doesn't work for a majority of New Yorkers. A majority of the city's sidewalks are narrower than eight feet, which is the minimum that is needed for small businesses uh, to do business in front of their space. Uh, also, it prevents our city's small businesses with limit, limited storefront spaces on narrow sidewalks from doing any business in a pandemic safe way. So we immediately call upon the mayor to let small businesses and street vendors operate in the same manner uh, that restaurants uh, have done so and that they should be able to utilize uh, the street. Second, we're eagerly waiting for the city's data set on vacant storefronts. This is a piece of legislation that was passed last year. Our research team provided ample background and information on how storefront spaces, vacant storefront spaces can help improve small businesses in this time period where there are many small businesses that may need larger spaces. We want this data so that we, we can analyze it. Um, we need this data immediately. It's due, where is it? Third, uh, during the pause, uh, we helped many small businesses get back on their feet by updating their information. Google Maps, Yelp, Foursquare, all were providing inaccurate information. In response to this need, uh, we helped mutual aid groups and community groups start crowdsourcing information and providing up-to-date information about essential services. We built this as an open platform. It's called Open Maps with nine community organizations across Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. These maps met the immediate needs of elder, elderly and immunocompromised neighbors. Uh, and if you want help, if you want assistance, if you're part of a bid that you wanna get information about your small businesses in your neighborhood, we're here to help you. We would love to get this platform out. Um, it's amazing that we have been advertising this platform and this opportunity to promote small businesses throughout the pandemic. Um, and somehow it has fallen on deaf ears at SBS and the CTO's office. Fourth, at a time when digital literacy is paramount, we were very, very disappointed that the city council cut funding to support uh, digital, digital literacy efforts initiatives, uh, and this directly affected community board's ability to learn new technologies and some more support community issues around small businesses needs. With that, I'll submit the rest of my testimony uh, in written format. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Uh, I, I have a question, Chair, uh, and, um, and this can go to any of the panelists that, that just testified. Um, uh, is there data that indicates what the average cost of setting up a basic website with e-commerce capabilities? Is there is there any data on that? And that goes for anybody? Um, the, there are a number of online turnkey solutions um, that somewhere, you know, depending upon how you want to host it, um, it's less than a couple hundred dollars. Thank you, because uh, it, it seems that some of the businesses are, are, are you know, are just in a fog about and the small. These are the smaller businesses that uh, want to set up a basic website. And we know about what 40 percent of the small businesses don't have a website. So um, they need that e-commerce capability. And, you know, so it, just a few hundred dollars seems like it's doable. And, and, and no, by the way, thank you for your testimony. We always rely on you. Uh, for information, and uh, I wish the city agencies would listen. Yeah, and Ch Chair Chair Holden, I, I would just you know expand upon that that you know in addition to building out the the website capacity, I think the the real barrier for e-commerce is getting those small businesses into those distribution centers and marketplaces, so they'll have a a broader market share, and then relying perhaps on the city council or, or the perhaps on the city council. Holden. To, um, to uh, cap the Amazon marketplace fees that, that are put on those businesses. Right. Hi, um, Chair Holden. I was gonna be in my testimony addressing your question. Um, my companies so, um, primarily target small businesses, especially restaurants and mom and pop stores. And I also want to bring to attention that um, Amazon recently implemented a new marketplace where Previously, they did not charge small businesses for selling on their platform, but now they're charging a $40 monthly fee. But I'll go into that in my testimony. Okay, thank you. Okay, back to committee council. 
you're muted. Thank you. And just a reminder to all panelists to please stay on mute until you are called to testify. At this point, we will move on to Albert Kahn of Stop Spying, followed by Helen Kogan of Empower. And Mr. Kahn, please begin when the sorry. I, I just want, can I just, uh, just ask a question of the uh, council? Um, at, at some hearings, we, we, uh, we do panels, like four panels at a time, and then we ask questions of the panels. Do you want us to ask questions of individual panelists? Um, or do you want it like a group of panelists? That, that, that's what I, you know, I, I don't know how this was set up, this, uh, the question and answers. Because I, I had, that was a broad, that was a broad question for the panelists that already spoke. So should we do individuals? Uh, Council Mayor, yes, uh, before the way this hearing was set up, it was that we would ask, Council Mayor would ask questions of each individual it, panel. Should, okay, that's all. That's and, all if, Thank you. and if you wish to go back to another panel, please uh, just call out their name so the muter knows. Okay. Thank muter. you. Thank you. And Mr. Khan, you may begin once the sergeant gives you the cue. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you so much for letting me testify today. My name is Albert Fox Khan. I'm the executive director of STOP, the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. And uh, the presentation I'll be giving today is a small excerpt of the longer written statement that has been submitted for the record. You know, today we met a new uh, landmark in COVID-19, a national record in the number of infections. So when we're talking about small businesses reopening, yes, it is an economic catastrophe for so many business owners across the city, but it's a matter of life and death. And today I wanna to focus on the technology that's being peddled to small businesses, oftentimes unproven, untested, unverified, not FDA approved, being marketed as a way to keep New Yorkers safe from COVID-19, even though there's no evidence it works. We've seen a proliferation of thermal imaging products, facial recognition products, algorithmically driven uh, software apps that are supposed to tell people if they're at risk of COVID-19. But while these apps sound incredible, like they could really make such a difference in our lives during this crisis, the truth is we oftentimes don't know if they actually live up to the rhetoric or if this is just another Theranos, just another high-tech snake oil uh, sales job. We've seen several of these apps, such as uh, thermal imaging scans, be disproven, shown to be unreliable. That with when you have a when you're trying to take someone's temperature, when you're doing it remotely over a distance using a thermal imaging camera, it's far less reliable than when you're actually taking someone's temperature manually. But on top of that, a temperature doesn't actually correlate effectively with COVID-19 infection. So this doesn't actually help tell us if New Yorkers are um, infected. We also see uh, a number of new air filtration technology uh, being deployed without guidance on which systems work, how well they work, how many are needed for a, a certain amount of physical space. And so you have you know, um, New, York, New Yorkers trying to figure this stuff out themselves, trying to, to make their businesses safe, but really needing guidance on what works and what doesn't. And the FDA hasn't been uh, keeping up with this. The federal government has largely immunized these companies against liability. Uh, for rolling out new technology during the pandemic. And above all, we need privacy protections and we wanna renew our call on the governor to sign Senate Bill 8450, which passed over the summer that would prevent a lot of the contact tracing data we see being collected through these platforms from being accessed by police or ICE. Because one thing that we're very concerned about is seeing this technology, seeing these highly invasive tools, which may not work at stopping COVID, being hijacked by law enforcement or immigration enforcement to be turned into a new way to track all New Yorkers. And that's something we can't allow to happen. Right. Thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to testify. Uh, thank you, Mr. Khan. Um, you know, we, we've seen that, uh, that without the science, um, we're, we're kind of blind and we, we, it's almost like um, snake oil salesmen have descended upon uh, society, because we don't, we're not sure what works. So um, what, what do you see as the biggest risk for both businesses and their customers in using surveillance technology and collecting biometrics? 
There are several risks. One is just that people are going to waste money. A lot of business owners are going to buy technology that doesn't do what it's supposed to. Number two, we're going to be collecting information, highly invasive information that can then be weaponized. And not just by you know the NYPD and government agents, which are always just one subpoena away from taking this information, but also by uh, hackers, by uh, people who try to break into these systems, by people who are selling this data, data that we give as part of a public health effort uh, to only then have it be used by ad tech and be used by marketing companies. We And we also have to recognize that this crisis, what we accept as normal and acceptable at, at, as part of our uh, you know, civic infrastructure during this crisis is likely to become a permanent facet of, of New York life. And, and if we allow this sort of really invasive tracking during the COVID-19 pandemic, we're likely to see it for years to come. But really, I, I think that you know the council can take action by um, outlawing some of these technologies, such as the more um, error-prone and biased uh, biometric tools. That you can also take action by protecting the privacy of this information. And you can also work with the administration to try to educate small business owners about how unreliable many of these tools are. But you know, I, I think that there's a real risk that as long as people don't have you know clear scientific guidance, and there's this risk of potential liability, people will use this public health theater to create the illusion of safety when we don't actually know in some of these cases what to do to give people real safety. Great, great. Thank you so much, Mr. Khan. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now hear testimony from Helen Kogan of Empower, followed by Nicole Kahn. And Ms. Kogan, please begin when the sergeant gives the cue. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you on this timely and very important matter. Um, I am the executive director of Empower New York. We are a workforce development and technology training program, a free program, a nonprofit for young adults. The impact of the pandemic on daily life is unprecedented and has elevated the need for access to technology as a way of life. I think we all know that. Um, this has had a disparate impact on poor and low wealth communities, limiting their access to education and employment opportunities. In addition to the disproportional health and economic impact of the pandemic, it has illuminated for all of you, you know this, uh, the, breadth, the breadth of the digital divide. Small businesses and nonprofits that serve the community have been negatively affected because of limited technology capacity and demand for, demand for tech talent. With the support of capital funding, Empower is in a position to develop a community help desk to sustain local small businesses and nonprofits with tech support needs. Empower is extending a recommendation to the New York City Council to undertake a broad-based reinvestment and modernization of capital funding specifically related to technology. Investment in new technology standards for funding will help close the digital divide, maximize tech reach and improve citizen digital literacy through the deployment of tech enabled infrastructure. Government leaders and business professionals across New York understand that our infrastructure need, need, needs major reinvestment and modernization. This forces us to carefully consider the potential impact of pursuing a new model for capital funding and finan financing tech infrastructure. Currently, the useful life guidelines for capital funding for tech projects consists of computer hardware, software networks, um, may have a useful life of three years after completion or installation. Additionally, the city guidelines will fund software under, won't fund software unless licenses are transferable to the city or the city's designee. Given that COVID-19 has changed the way we live, work, and teach in our communities, we need to evolve different levels of tech needs. And Power urges the New York City Council to update its capital funding investment and in technology and its guidelines for relocation of funds to tech needs of the larger community of constituents. During these under-resourced under under and resource-constrained times for the city and nonprofits like Empower that rely on tech to assist our students, we need to remove barriers of the digital divide. Collectively, this reinvestment of capital funding and Wi-Fi, hotspots, software will be used to transform how technology is accessed in New York City and increase digital literacy. 
New York City needs to move beyond traditional tech capital funding. Our city's core, con core attribute is interconnectivity. This requires that we be more flexible to meet the digital demand and provide more capital funding opportunities. And power will be provided. We'll have a follow-up conversation with the Committee of Small Business and the Committee on Technology to continue exploring the review of capital funding guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now move on to Nicole Khan, and she will be followed by Guy or Guy Yedwab of the League of Independent Theaters, who is our last registered panelist. And Ms. Khan, you may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Thank you. Time starts now. Hey, um, City Council, I run a small boutique bread design firm. It primarily works with small businesses, restaurants, and mom and pop stores. We provide menus for restaurants that enable them to increase their online deliver, um, delivery mechanism. They don't, does not require them to learn any software. It's friendly to think they already know, such as email, text, and phone. And the best part of this is that they increase their delivery revenue at no cost to them. There's no fees associated with using our website, just the initial setup of the website. Okay, as far as restaurants in the area, I've noticed it's increased in sidewalk traffic and people waiting for restaurants. I propose creating a queuing app where patrons can be notified by text messaging when um, a seat is available in a restaurant or they can enter a store to avoid having people standing around in sidewalks. Also, we can also um, employ internet technology and utilize technology such as Wi-Fi extenders to allow let's say a row of built um, businesses on one side of the street to use one internet connection. Okay, I also, um, I'm an advocate and I would like to see some sort of technology implemented so people can contact the city council regarding any kind of issues. Constituents, including myself, have been trying to contact the city council for months. I started a petition regarding housing and evictions the city council created a um, law last year banning um, the use of landlords for security deposit over one month. This has prevented a lot of people from exiting situations where they can no longer afford the apartments they're in and they don't qualify for um, you know, a new apartment. Okay, this petition and emails I've sent to the city council have not been responded to at whatsoever. Also, in um, restaurants, they can utilize, we're thinking of creating um, a convection-based heating technology to kill COVID in the air with heat, which will also enable them to warm the um, inner restaurants or, you know, spaces. Funding for that will be needed. Also, I had interactions with the NYPD and I was a victim of a hate crime. I tried to file multiple police reports and these reports were not accurate information is intentionally left out of this report. And I propose you guys create a utilized technology to enable people to file police reports where this does not happen, that people do not get marginalized, who are marginalized, don't get left out, don't receive proper police services, etc. Okay, that's the end of my testimony and I will be able to take any questions and I would love to um, employ these technologies, especially for restaurants and small Businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from Mr. Yedwab of the League of Independent Theaters, who is our last registered panelist, and you may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Thank you. Time starts now. Great. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Guy Yedwab, board president of the League of Independent Theater. We're an advocacy organization that represents small size biz, uh, theaters in all five boroughs uh, in every community across the city. We're also a member of the United for Small Business New York City Coalition of Legal Services and Small Business Organizations fighting to defend small business across the city. In 2019, before this uh, COVID crisis began, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment issued a report on the economic impact of small theater uh, in New York City documenting how small theater generates $1.3 billion of economic input and 8,400 full-time jobs. 
The report also highlighted that one of the top challenges impacting our industry before the crisis was a shortage of working space. Uh, live performance has to be done in physical spaces uh, in order for these businesses to operate. As commercial rents climb higher and landlords turn towards luxury spaces to maximize revenue, we were already fighting the closure of rehearsal and performance space. Obviously that crisis has only intensified. We might be a year away from live performance returning uh, and the Center for an Urban Future found the small to mid-sized organizations have lost between 17 to 50% of their operating budgets. We've already seen a number of physical spaces, theaters and rehearsal studios going out of business permanently. The top way that city council can address this cri crisis is by using city council's power over commercial rents to provide rental relief. But the top ways that city council can use technology to address our industry uh, is some ways to uh, make spaces that exist today more equitably ac accessible to performing artists, both during the crisis and into the long-term future. By creating websites that make available space more transparently accessible and searchable, the city can help unlock resources we already have in our communities. First, we call upon these committees to support Council Member Cumbo's intro, uh, introduction 2034, which requires uh, the Department of Information Technology and Communication to create a mobile application to coordinate the use of open space for cultural programming. This would allow live performance to take place in parks and plazas and really open up some of the space that already exists. Secondly, uh, we call on city council to help provide funding for a nonprofit called Indie Space. There used to be a search engine where we could find other performance venues and, uh, and rehearsal studios. Unfortunately, uh, it went under due to the crisis. So we no longer have a way to search those spaces. These two ways of being able to search for available spaces can greatly unlock the resources that we all have today with minimal investment in technology and huge social uh, and economic in, uh, dividends. Uh, thank you all for your time and your support for our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, if we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has not yet been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you'll be called in the, in the order that the hand was raised. Okay, seeing none at this point, I would ask uh, Chair Jonai or Chair Holden to offer any closing remarks or and adjourn the hearing, thank you. Chair Holden, uh, I want to thank you for co-chairing this hearing with me. Obviously, uh, we veered off a little bit on um, the focus of this hearing, which should have been how we're going to use technology to help our small businesses survive this pandemic and this crisis. Um, I was hoping to hear more from, as I'm sure you are, uh, to hear from SBS on clear solutions and as one of the, uh, one of the those testifying uh, stated, New York City has no plan on how to address the dire straits that our small businesses are in. So we're gonna hopefully hear back on some of the questions that were posed to this administration. And Chair, I'm looking forward to continuing fighting for, for these small businesses so they can survive. Thank you. And uh, I wanna thank you, Chair Joan I, for this important hearing. We did, um, we did have to address certain and very, very important issues that had have arisen very, very recently. Um, and but the technology, we good thing about uh, at least uh, on the technology side, uh, we've connected with organizations like Tech NYC and Beta NYC who, who do a terrific job. And I'd like to meet with them to discuss this further. And I'd like to hear from them, um, you know, when we go offline and talk more about future hearings on this, because I don't think, like you said, I don't think that we're getting the right answers from the administration on how to save our small businesses, how to help our small businesses and how to give them advice on technology. So it's up to the organizations we heard today that testified uh, to guide us apparently, because I'm not, we're not getting um, the information from our, our agencies, our, our city agencies. So 
Uh, we're going to have further hearings on this. This is very, very important. It looks like we're not coming out of the pandemic any anytime soon. So we're going to rely on technology to try to help us uh, hasten the exit and, and how to get back to uh, some kind of uh, normal situation in New York City. Thank you, Chair John I, and thank you, um, Committee Council, for this hearing. I'll give you the honors of uh, closing out the hearing, Chair Holden. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, we, if it's no more testimony, there's nobody else. So uh, uh, this meeting is uh, adjourned. Chair, <clears throat> there's someone's hand is raised. Oh, we got one more. Okay. Hi, I just wanted to um, ask if who I could follow up with the um, issues that I raised regarding, you know, providing the small businesses with the technology the housing related technology of contacting the city council, et cetera. Because yeah. I've tried relentlessly to contact the city council to be via email and have received no response from anyone. Who's, whose office did you uh, try to contact? I contacted um, each individual committee, each individual um, council member, the speaker, Okay, if you if you contact uh, the chair Joe and I's or my office, we'll we'll definitely respond. All right, thank you. Okay, Ms. Khan, I'll give you a phone number from my office, and you can ask for Reggie Johnson, my chief of staff, and I'm happy to help address your concerns. That okay. number is 718-931-1721. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Holden. You want to close this out? Okay, uh, thank you everyone for the hearing. This uh, hearing is adjourned.